Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the um, third class. Um, so third lecture of the class. So let's start it. So this topic is um, TLS. So as I briefly mentioned in the first class, um, so we will learn, we will focus on four security protocols on our internet. So starting from the IP level and the transport layer and application layer, all right? But uh, for your uh, easy you know, understanding, so we're gonna start from a, a kind of backward approach, right? So we first focus on the DNS protocol. And now uh, from the second lecture, uh, third lecture, we will focus on transfer layer security protocols, which is TLS, okay? So TLS is one of the uh, most popular protocols that you use every day uh, for web browsing, and also whenever you open apps okay, in your mobile phone, I believe most of the communication between your mobile phone and the web solvers, communicating solvers will be encrypted using TLS. So now let's move on what the TLS is and how, what kinds of problems are, are, are in TLS. So TLS, SSL, uh, it's actually SSL is the you know, kind of old protocol. So it is a, an application layer protocol for confidentiality. So we, we are going to use this protocol to encrypt the communication channel it's because we are uh, encrypting it. So it provides also integrity. Integrity means the content is not being modified at all. Okay. And authentication. So um, between clients and server. So this protocol was first, uh, first introduced in 1995, right? By the first mobile browser, which is Netscape, right? Uh, I'm pretty sure that most of you uh, may not be familiar with the Netscape, but this was the, the first web browser in the history. So if you're more interested in, uh, please take a look at you know, Wikipedia. Um, so SSL, the first version was called SSL and it was designed to encapsulate HTTP. Encapsulate the mean is we are just the ceiling entire communication channel of HTTP. So that called HTTPS. So then what is TLS? So it was defined in 1999 and the issue is supersedes SSL because SSL, the original protocol had some insecure, uh, the, some security problems. So now we are using TLS. So it, this protocol sits between transport, transport and application layer. So when you think about the network five layers, it sits between transport layer and application layer. So which means TLS is not application specific protocol. So it, it, no matter what kinds of application protocol you're gonna use, we can use TLS to encrypt the entire communication channel. So I'm not sure uh, if I have time to talk about DNS over HTTPS protocol later. So as you know, as we covered, DNS is an application layer protocol. So we use UDP for DNS. Of course, TCP is supported, but mainly we use UDP. So DNS over HTTPS is, or DNS over TLS, uh, we steal the entire DNS communication channel using TLS or HTTPS. So as you can tell from this example, TLS and other HTTPS protocols can be used to uh, encrypt another application channel, okay? So that's why uh, this bullet says TLS sits between transport and application layer, okay? So um, both client and server must have a asymmetric key pair. So typically, whenever you go to HTTPS supported website, uh, this website has a, a private public key pairs, right? And use these key pairs to first authenticate, verify themselves that I am the domain name you're thinking, right? So let's say you'd like to visit google.com and you want to make sure that the website that you just visited is actually google.com, okay? So server can use this private public key pairs to verify 
to authenticate themselves that they are actually google.com. And after that, using a, another protocol, uh, Diffie Hellman Key Exchange or another key exchange protocol, they agreed to have a, a single symmetric key pair between client and server and use that key to encrypt and decrypt the communication. Yeah. Then you might be wondering, hey, the server, you just mentioned that the server already has uh, symmetric, uh, asymmetric key pair, probably private key pair. Why don't we use the key pairs to encrypt and decrypt the communication channel, right? You can ask about it, right? But the thing is, as I quickly mentioned in the first DNS class, symmetric key encryption decryption operation is much faster than asymmetric key pairs, okay? So we use, so what we do, what we use in, uh, what, what we use with public private key pairs is, we use this asymmetry key pairs to authenticate themselves, their identity, and after that, agree on a single symmetry key for entire communication, okay? So that is the concept. Then now the solver, let's say we typically go to, for example, so they are, the so a client can use this asymmetry key pair to identify themselves. So we call it client authentication. But in, in usually for just you know normal communication, we typically use just a solver uh, style uh, authentication, okay? So, so let's say the solver uh, uses a asymmetry key pair to provide that authenticity and the confidentiality and integrity, okay? In the case, the solver uses a certificate, okay? The certificate contains the public key and the client, when, when uh, once it receives a certificate from the solver, then the client can verify the certificate is authentic, right? And if the client uh, successfully validates the certificate is authentic, then the clients can finally guarantee that, oh, this solver must be the google.com that I was originally uh, wanted to visit. Okay. So it also uses a PKI. Okay. So I'm going to talk about this all concept in the next slide. So let's briefly, uh, you know, and over the, uh, on the, uh, you know, 10,000 fit, uh, fit uh, point of view, Let's talk about how HTTPS works, yeah? So let's say a, your browser wants to communicate, you know, wants to go to a, your website such as google.com, okay? Then we are using HTTPS, so google.com must have a your private and public key pair, okay? And their proposal of using this two, two keys is to let browser verify that I am actually google.com, okay? So to do that, the website first, before this entire, before this communication has happened, <clears throat> the website must have uh, went to, uh, gone to a uh, certificate of 30, which is called just uh, CA, okay? Then the CA is a trusted third party entity. So big assumption in alert, the, one of the big assumptions here in this diagram is browser also trust certificate authority, okay? So this CA after some vetting processes, so such as it could be a, a kind of domain name validation. So for example, google.com wants to verify, uh, the CA wants to verify that the communication ent communicating entity, google.com, is actually google.com, managed by google.com. So in the case, maybe certificate authority can ask google.com to host, uh, to put a, a random DNS entries in under google.com so that the a CA can check their existence. And uh, finally, they can know that, oh, google.com actually, uh, the communicating entity that I'm, you know, communicating entity is actually uh, controlling google.com, okay? Or CA may ask uh, this website to prove the ownership of the domain name by asking a document such as uh, uh, the purchase history of the domain name with the registrars or, you know, so offline records, okay? So 
after this vetting process, after the CEAs can finally confirm that this web of communicating entity is actually google.com, then the CEA uh, provides a publishes a certificate. The certificate contains a public key information of the website and it is signed by this certificate's private key, okay? So let's say uh, in this example, CEA is a very sign. So the very signs can ver uh, create a certificate and then make it signed by its private key, okay? And uh, the website now, whenever a browser connects to their server, the website can give them back a certificate. So the browsers can verify the certificate signature, right? Whether it is signed by a, a, some CA's uh, a private key and uh, which is ultimately signed by a, a root certificate, basically root public key, right? So that you can verify the signature using root public key, right? So again, if it is signed something with uh, by private key, you can verify it using uh, the matched the corresponding public key. Okay, so I'm pretty sure that once you see this chain, you may recall something, right? It is very similar to DNS tag. Okay, so this is the diagram that I showed you in the last class, right? So what I mean is, what it means by is. The in the higher level operation, it is exactly same as DNSSEC. Okay, so the website, uh, so for normal users, they can trust a, a set of just public keys, small set of public keys, which is called which are called root stores. Okay, so again, certificate is still just a form of uh, containing a, a public key. Okay? So basically root certificates mean uh, the root stores, uh, what, what it means is a set of certificates that lives a uh, list of that list a public keys, a set of public keys, which a users can trust. Okay. So um, let's say you go to a random just domain name, for example, example.com using HTTPS and the, uh, the example.com web server will give you a certificate to verify that, hey, I am actually, you know, I am actually example.com, right? But the thing is the certificate contains the public key and which is not in your root store. So you have to verify whether the certificate is ultimately signed by one of your public key in your root root stores. Okay, so uh, after this validation process is done, right? Checking all the chain of trust. Uh, once the validation is done, now you can verify that the app or the website is authentic. Yeah. So so far, uh, we talked about certificate, right? And we just I just mentioned that the certificate is just form of you know method that contains a public key. Okay, then what is the certificate? Suppose let's say you build your website, right? And you want to create a, a TLS, you know, uh, you want to support HTTPS. Okay, then you need a, a certificate, right? Then how do you get one, right? The first you know, the easiest choice is you can generate a certificate yourself. Okay? So if you are using Linux, if you are Windows users, then you can uh, connect the, you, know, um, you probably have it access to the uh, uh, university cluster, right? Which is uh, Linux based. So type open SSL to generate a, a new asymmetry key pair. And also you can use this command to um, generate a certificate. So I'm gonna show you a, a one example later, but let's say uh, the concept here is the option, the first option is you can make your own key pairs as well as certificate, okay? And you can use this certificate and to serve the, you know, serve the certificate to the users that uh, connects to your web server, okay? Then, what is the problem, right? Because you generate a certificate, which is not signed by any trusted, commonly trusted CAs. So uh, the other users 
basically other browsers cannot authenticate your certificate. Okay, because they probably have a set of root certificates they still they trust, right? They only trust, and they try to validate your certificate by creating a chain of certificates, right? Chain of trust. But your cert your certificate that you just degenerated by yourself is not signed by any trusted CA, so which means. They, their trusted with the store cannot eventually cannot verify your certificate. Okay, so users will be shown a scary security warning red background, right? Showing, hey, you're visiting the website which is not secure. Okay, so we have to, which means we, whenever we'd like to use a, a certificate. We have to go to certificate authorities, which are the roots of trust in the TLS public key infrastructure. All right, that is the kind of slightly, you know, uh, different uh, to the PKI of DNSSEC. Okay, so there was no third party in DNSSEC. You can go to your registrar, right, and uh, you. You can create your DNS keys, and what you can, what you should do to create a chain of trust to enable DNSSEC, right? Is you can just upload your DS record to your uh, TLDs, top level domain names, right? So there was no uh, third parties involved in for creating a, a DNS key process generation process, of course. The problem of the NSA was you have to use, you have to communicate with the registrar that uh, sold a domain name to you to upload your DNS key, uh, your DS record. Um, but as a side note, there there is another protocol called a CDNS key and the CD, a CDS record, which bypasses a uh, registrar. So if you're interested in, please take a look. But the bad news is it is not widely supported yet. A couple of uh, country level TLDs currently supported. Okay, so let's go back to uh, third certificate authorities. Okay? So CAs are the roots of trust in the TLS PKI. So there are tons of companies that you can use: Semantic, Verisign, Forte, GeoTrust, and Komodo. And currently, well, the market share, I guess, more than. 50% of the market shares are by, uh, is dominated by less encrypt. I'm gonna talk about this later. Uh, so these CAs are third parties, but they issue a certificate for you. And of course, um, to, as you can tell, CEA has a great power, which comes with the great responsibility. So to become a CA is not straightforward. Of course, you have to create a self-science root certificate and you have to persuade uh, uh, major browser vendors to include, or sometimes OSs, right? To include your certificate with their software. And also if your private key that matched with the public keys and the certificates are stolen, you're basically in a problem, no, big problem, okay? So you, you you have to keep your private key secret, right? At all costs, no matter what it costs, okay? So the, one of the very, uh, one of the limitations, and uh, I'm probably sure that you must see lots of HTTPS related security incident, um, and this is because of this fundamental problem of this certificate authorities model, okay? Because any CA can issue a certificate for any domain, right? So for example, let's say, and potentially let's say Komodo got compromised, right? In the case, let's say Komodo uh, uh, hacked by, I don't know, smart hackers and they stolen all the you know, private keys for these matched public keys of the root stores. Then what these attackers can do is they can generate any certificates, right? To any domain names, which will be trusted by all browsers, right? So 
uh, the only thing that stops me from buying a certificate for google.com is a validate verification process, okay? So CAs, third parties, basically can generate any certificates to any domain names. So uh, that is the kind of weakest link of this TLS uh, higher uh, public key infrastructure. So to get this certificate, for example, Bank of America, which is, which is one of the largest bank in the United States. So they have, they have to, to get this certificate. They have to generate a key pair, okay? Private and public key. And after that, they generate a certificate signing request, which is, which is called CSR. Uh, basically, no, this is the form to be sent to the CEAs to ask for issuing a certificate. Huh? So, of course, they have to pay, you know, they, they have to pay the fee. And the very signs will manually or you know, automatically check the requester if they to make sure they own the domain name or of bankofamerica.com. Okay. And after this validation process, it generates a certificate and signs it with the very science key to generate the signature. And so that the uh, Bank of America can use the certificate to serve their customers, right? Then let's take a look. What kinds of information is are in the X519 certificate? X519 is the, just the name of the formation, okay, format. So yeah. The first part is a subject, right? The information about uh, this domain. So this example was captured in a long, you know, back you know, to 2015, right? So the example is outdated, but uh, the information is based, the format of the information is basically same as this is, okay? So let's say we connected it to Google, I'm sorry, github.com, right? Then you can check the, in the subject category, uh, hey, there is a common name. The domain name that you visited is the github.com. Okay? And the uh, issuer information, the certificate is signed and generated by Digicert, which is one of the largest CAs. And each certificate has a validity period. So, um, so this cert if the certificate expires, then even if the signature is valid, the client has to reject the certificate, expire the certificate, okay? Because imagine if the certificate's validity period is like three or four years, right? Then what if the certificate's match the private key has been stolen, right? Then the certificate looks still valid, right? Even if it is stolen, it is if, if it is still used by attackers, the certificate will be still you know, valid. So basically, this validity period defines the vulnerability window, okay? So these days, most of the website certificate validity period is just a dream, okay? So we're gonna come back to this topic later. And of course, uh, there is a, a public key information, so RSA key, and there are some you know, public information such as modulus in here. Um, there can, the certificate structure can be extended. So it can be basically evolved, okay? But X519 structure is based on AS1, ASN format, ASN1 format. So it is very aesthetic, but uh, as you can tell, it's just a key and map value, but it can be extended. So a uh, certificate has a extensions field. So we can, you know, as time goes by, uh, the stakeholders can define a, a new a new structure and a new functionality, and they can add this kind of information in the extension field. Okay. Um, one of the uh, prominent examples is uh, SAN subject alternative names. So as you can tell from is naming alternative names, it means. This certificate, this public key cannot be, not only be used for a, a github.com, but also can be used for many domain names specified in this SAN field, so such as github.com or www.github.com. 
when you go to YouTube, google.com and to get the certificate and take a look at this subject alternative names field, then you will see a large number of, you know, many, many, many domain names uh, managed by Google, okay? And uh, CRL and OCSP, we're gonna jump back to this topic later, okay? So, um, let me, uh, uh, show you uh, the real example of certificate. So this is the um, website of Sungyungan University. So I just used my Chrome and let's say you will see this padlock icon because I just connected it using HTTPS, okay, which is this communication is secured. Okay. So now you can click this lock icon and it says connection is secure, so click it. And it says certificate is followed, which means the browsers, the reason why you were able to see this content, SKKU's content, was because browsers successfully already validate the con uh, validate this certificate. If the certificate were invalid, then you'd not been able to see this content because the connection must have been disabled, you know, terminated. You know? So let's take a look at this certificate, okay? Um, so uh, there are some basic information here, but we are you know, interested because we just studied the structure of the certificate. So let's take a look at the details, okay? So let me first focus on this hierarchy. So SKKU website actually not only handed to you a single certificate of SKKU, but it also gave you a certificate chain so that you can validate the chain of certificate, right? Checking the signatures, right? So uh, the LIF one is LIF certificate, okay? The last one is LIF certificate, uh, which is, as you can tell, there is a hierarchy. So this certificate is just generated by, I'm sorry, issued by, was issued by Forte, which, was, which is one of the largest CAs. Now let's look at the information of SKKU certificate. So there is a version, serial number, and what the serial number is basically, you know, serial number. So each CA manages, keeps track, keeps tracking of the certificates of the, uh, that they issued to a certain domain name uh, by managing a unique identifier. So each domain name uh, issued by the same, or. Um, uh, same CAs, they have a, a unique serial numbers, okay? So there is a valid period, not before, it is only valid from uh, uh, you know, June to July uh, next year, okay? So the certificate valid period is basically a year, okay? And there's a subject key information such as public key information. Subject is common name is SKKU. Right, because we just connected to SKKU, and there are a bunch of uh, extensions. So when you go to uh, subject alternative names, you can see SKKU, AC.KR. Right, it is also when you go to this website, SKKU.AC.KR, and you will see the same certificate will be retrieved by the website. Okay. Um. Yeah, and the fingerprint information is also here. So now the H, so you, let's, in the, um, so you created, a, you wanted to create a TLS connection. The first, using a TCP connections, after the TCP connection is made, you send a command, command called it's client hello, okay? Client hello and the server hello will information will be given and the certificate information is also handed by the website so that you can validate the certificate. So um, this certificate, so after the client hello, uh, the, all the subsequent information can be, communication can be encrypted uh, in the current version of TLS 1.3, but uh, for this, you know, uh, but this extent, this, this version of TLS was pretty new. So let's just um, treat this information. It's just, you know, unencrypted yet, okay? 
And at the end, after the client validates a certificate, basically all the chains, and uh, after the certificate guarantee, you know, kind of com confirms the certificate is valid, then they create a um, kind of symmetric key, which will be used to encrypt and decrypt all the communication uh, between uh, you and Bank of America. So uh, we mentioned this work. So I just showed you in the real world examples. Um, so, and because I just introduced you the OpenSSL command. So let me give you a, a kind of one example how you can use OpenSSL to analyze the certificate. Yep. So let's say, hmm, okay. So you can use OpenSSL, this command, to connect the solver and to get the certificate information. So OpenSSL, using an OpenSSL, what I did was I just finished it this step, okay? This step, okay? So I just create a certificate and the validated and um, yeah. So this is a certificate, okay? Um, so let me show you how you can val uh, parse the certificate. So the certificate is can be saved in the binary format and also base64 encoded format. So we usually use PAM or DER format. So this is the certificate information. So let's say we want to parse this certificate and we can copy and let's say SKKU PAM. I'm gonna use the PAM format, right? And copy and paste, right? So there is a, uh, I just create a SKKU, right? Um, PAM file, and I can use OpenSSL command to uh, parse. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use OpenSSL command to parse this certificate to extract all the information. So I'm gonna letting you uh, letting the OpenSSL that hey I'm going to input the PAM format and this is the file that I'd like to parse and I'd like to text format. Yeah? Enter. Then as you can tell, you will see the exactly same parsed information that you saw in the uh, Chrome browser. Okay? Subject information here, SKKU, and issuer is Digicert Torte. Serial number is here, public key information is here, and extensions such as subject alternative names like SKKU.edu and AC.care. Yeah. And there are signature algorithms so that you can verify this signature by using the issuer's public. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So Then what is the problem of HTTPS, okay? It's not the uh, uh, HTTPS problem, you know, per se, but there can there is a you know, many in the middle of tech ha happening using HTTPS, okay? So in this example, the there is a man in the middle attacker and the, its objective is to see the, you know, encrypt, uh, the decrypt the encrypted content. Okay, so again, when you create a session channel between you and the, the server using HTTPS, the communication channel will be encrypted. So anyone cannot, you know, the no one can decrypt the communication channel, okay? But let's assume there is a, and this is a hypothetical scenario. So let's say browser, um, tries to connect the website at the first place. But uh, let's say there was a man in the middle of attackers. So browser actually create a communication channel with this attacker. But these attackers, what, what they decided to do was, it ought to, as soon as browsers tries to make a connection to the website, this attacker can snatch it, this you know, client hello message and return the browser to the, um, you know, try to make a connection between 
uh, browser and the man in the middle attackers. And also man in the middle attacker, they create a connection, HTTPS connection to the website. Okay, so from the website perspective, they have a legitimate the connection, you know, client, which is the attacker. And the server, the browser will see a certificate, which look like a valid, right? And the common name, all the thing is Bank of America, but it was signed by attackers private key. Yeah. So as you can tell, it is not a single connection. There are two uh, TLS connections. Then the problem is the browsers, because this certificate is not signed by Verisa. So in this example, in this example, uh, the, the certificate, the, uh, this is a, actually a typo, okay? It's a mistake. This certificate has to be signed, right? By the attacker's certificate, okay? Attacker's private key, right? Then the browser, as soon as it received a certificate from the attacker, which is signed by attacker, right? Private key. Then the browser will complain that the certificate cannot be validated because the certificate is signed by, um, signed, it is not signed by any of the stores, right? So to make this attack be successful, uh, the assumption is attackers were successfully uh, installed their certificate into the browser's uh, root store, right? That is the reason why you should not uh, the install a, a kind of shady you know, software because as soon as you try to you try to install that kind of you know, shady uh, sketchy software, they will try to install you know root certificate on your root stores to make the your connections you know uh, to make any certificate signed by the attackers uh, be trusted by your OS. Yeah. Um, so, so there was a, uh, you know, Kazakhstan government because of the, uh, there, it, it, this happened about, I believe, uh, two years ago, the Kazakhstan government, they tried to, uh, install a, uh, certificate, uh, to their citizens to, uh, bypass to many, the launch a many, the mobile attack to all, to their, you know, citizens. So Apple and the Google, Microsoft, and Mozilla, they banned it out, Kazakhstan certificate as well. Um, so now let's uh, move one step further into a uh, cert uh, authentication process. So uh, during the TLS initiation, the client receive a certificate chain from a server. And uh, this chain contains the server certificate as well as the signing CA certificate uh, and also the root certificate. And the client must validate the certificate chain to establish a trust. Basically, uh, you know, synthetically, um, synthetically they have to verify it's a signature uh, to make sure that cert uh, the signature is uh, actually signed by the CEAs and their, uh, the parents uh, public key, which is ultimately and to the root certificates public key, okay? So not only for checking this signature, there are lots of semantic uh, validation process have to, be, uh, have to be done. For example, uh, does the solver's DNS name in the C common name field or uh, the solver's DNS name, DNS name? Let's say you go to google.com by typing google.com domain name and the certificate uh, contains, has to contain the domain name. Okay? Because let's say you validate the certificate example.com and the example.com certificate must have a valid signature signed by a CA. So by looking at the chain itself, it is valid. But the problem is example.com cannot be verified using common name, which is google.com, right? So the common name has to be matched with the domain name that you just visited, okay? And also, 
the certificate has to be, as I said, it has to be, uh, uh, in, it, it's not expired. It has to be you know, in the working time. And the CA signature has to be critically valid. And also the last one, the certificate has to be on not revoked. Okay. So I'm going to talk about this concept later. So as I said, in the uh, first uh, uh, couple of slides, a CA, as you can tell, a CA is essentially a trusted third party, which has mighty power. Yeah. Um, so if a CA mistakenly, of course, purposefully signs a certificate for the domain name and provides it to your malicious principal, TLS can be subverted because we rely on a certificate and we just, you know, if certificate is valid, we just believe the certificate is actually valid, right? But, uh, you know, it has to be issued and managed by the original domain name holder, right? The holder the, or owner, right? So not only must we trust with the certificate or with the CAs, but also intermediate CAs that have a delegated signing authority. Yeah. So that's why we have to make all our efforts, you know, CAs have to make all their efforts to trust, to make sure their private key is you know, intact, not be stolen. So clearly the CA security must be protected at all costs for sure. And the possession of the CA security is just, you know, you just got the mighty power. So, which becomes attractive target for adversaries. Um, so, signatures should be only issued after verifying the identity of the requester. So, it is called in a domain name valid. Validation should be easy, right? But actually, it is not it's because there have been lots of incidents the CAs, you know, just failed. For example, uh, 2001. VeriSign issued two code signing certificate to someone claiming to be Microsoft to uh, could be used, which could be used to issue a untrusted software update. So uh, from this example, I just mentioned that, you know, one example of the HTTPS as a kind of, you know, example of TLS, but TLS can be used for any other application layer protocols as well. So one prominent you know, example is of course cosine PKI. It is, it is not a protocol, but it is also used to rely on uh, TLS. For example, whenever you download a, a new update from Microsoft, right? Then the, your OS has to make sure that this executable is valid and also it is from Microsoft, right? So to prove that, Whenever the new updates release, the Microsoft assigns the executable using their, you know, sort of private key, so that the the OS can check this update, verify this, you know, update using one of its root stores, right? So, but what happened in two thousand one? Verisign issued a two a certificate, which is valid looking but it was never requested by Microsoft, which means if the certificate were actually used by you know, attackers, then attackers were able to make uh, some clients, some OSs, window machines to install some you know, shady, sketchy softwares. Okay. And Komodo, uh, yep, it was hacked. Digital order 2011, this private key has been stolen. So all the um, you know, major web browsers like Google and Mozilla, uh, they blacklist the entire certificate, Mozilla's uh, the digital order uh, CA. So which lead, which led the CAs you know, bankrupted. So this is a kind of really hard problem to solve, right? Certificate, let's imagine that, you know, this certificate just, you know, hack the certificate, um, you know, CAs got hacked, CA issued a certificate, but, you know, at first glance, the certificate is just valid, right? It has a valid signature, it's not expired, the domain name will be matched, right? The signature is perfect, right? So a certificate has been misissued, but in the perspective of the client, 
the certificate seems legit, right? Then the, this is the really difficult questions. And how can you protect clients from accepting this valid looking but misissued certificates, right? That is the key challenge, right? Actually, this is still not unsolved problems, okay? So there are many protocols, you know, many techniques introduced so far to uh, solve this problem, but uh, it is not, you know, entirely solved yet, okay? So anyway, so we're gonna talk, of, we're gonna learn some uh, uh, revocation protocol. So revocation is uh, needed to, uh, as a kind of last check, the client has to, after validating the certificate at the last, the last step, the certificate, the client has to check if this certificate has never been revoked or not. Yeah. So imagine this scenario. We're gonna come back to scenario again at the last class, but uh, uh, let's say the website, you know, I got this private key has been stolen. So attackers got his private key, which means he can impersonate this website, right? So as soon as the website notices the key has been stolen, then the, it has to report back to CEAs that, hey, my key has been stolen. So please revoke my certificate. Okay, so this example is just one of the you know, many examples how the certificate can be revoked, right? Sometimes CEA notice that there is a kind of major glitch of their system. So maybe they can decide, hey, I'm going to revoke all certificates which were issued from X to Y, right? So if you're interested and you can take a look at the, uh, the incident that happened about two years ago or three years ago, um, there was a, uh, the swap CA called Less Encrypt. They uh, tried to revoke about more than millions of the certificate because of their buggy software. Yeah. So anyway, so CA, uh, after getting this revoke, uh, revocation request, the certificate authority, uh, you know, revoked their certificate and they have to maintain, they have to keep track of this revoked certificate. Of course, there are many, many, many uh, revoked certificate. So the browser now has to, uh, has to check whether the certificate has been revoked or not by communicating with the CA. So there are um, uh, two protocols we are going to study. Uh, which is CRL, the certificate revocation list, which is the pool base and the query base, which is called OCSP. So we're gonna you know, uh, jump on this topic uh, in the next class, all right? So for a brief recap, uh, we learn how HTTPS work, right? HTTPS works, you know, from the 10,000 uh, foot point of view. And we learned that HTTPS based on the TLS protocol. So TLS protocol can be used for many other, you know, communication protocols, you know, no matter what kind of application level protocol you use. And, and to support TLS, a, to, to support TLS, we use a, a certificate, okay, which contains a, a public key information and using public key, we validate if this public key can be verified uh, ultimately by a, a root public key that you only trust, which is the same model of the DNSSEC we learned uh, in the last class. And there are many information in the TLS so that using this information, you have to verify the certificate, but sometimes even valid looking certificate can be invalid, right? And because of the uh, compromises of the private key. So we will learn how we can deal with the situation by using a revocation protocol, which we're going to talk about next, next class. All right. All right. Um, thank you so much. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me, tj at Virginia Tech Okay. Thank you so much and see you next class. Bye.